Hello everyone. Thanks for signing up for today's live broadcast on Fundamentals of Fluorescence. I'm John Goldie, Forensic Engineer at Hariba Scientific and moderator for today's event. Hariba Scientific is the global leader in fluorescent spectroscopy solutions. We offer the most extensive line of fluorescent steady state, lifetime, hybrid instruments and microscope based solutions from compact fluorometers to modular spectral fluorometer systems. Coupled with our wide range of components, software and accessories, we are able to create an optimum solution for all needs and budgets. And over the years, we've incorporated the products of and know-how from Specs, IBH, Joben Yvonne, Photon Technology International, and SLM, the dominant names in fluorescent spectroscopy. This webinar is designed as an introduction to the theory and basic instrumentation, methods, and applications of fluorescent spectroscopy. Our goal is to present researchers using fluorescence with a basic understanding of how fluorescent spectra and time-resolved fluorescent decays can report on physical properties on a molecular scale. These are a few important announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically. Next, feel free to ask questions during this webinar. You can submit questions by typing them in the QA box on the QA widget at the bottom of the presentation window. If you have technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Now, I'll introduce today's speaker. We are very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Karen Stege Gall, Application Scientist at Hariba Scientific. Dr. Gall received her BS in Chemistry from the University of Rhode Island in 2003 and her PhD from Rutgers University in Chemistry and Chemical Biology in 2008. Her graduate work in physical chemistry focused on probing different solvent environments for polymetric nanomaterials using steady state and time resolved fluorescence of cumin dyes. Dr. Gall has been an application science, uh, scientist in the fluorescence group at Hariba Scientific since 2007. She is also the software product manager for the, for the fluorescence product line. Dr. Gall, take it away. Hello, and welcome to our webinar today entitled Fluorescence, Fundamentals of Fluorescence Spectroscopy. I'm Karen Gall, and I'm an application scientist at Hariba Scientific in the Fluorescence Division. There are many types, different types of spectroscopy, which can be used for identification of materials and molecules. Raman, infrared, and near-infrared vibrational spectroscopy, ICP emission and other atomic spectroscopies, X-ray fluorescence, and NMR are used for identifying chemical functional groups or specific atoms by sharp peaks, depending on the technique. They are all very useful, of course. Fluorescence spectroscopy is a bit different. Fluorescent spectra vary widely from very narrow to very broad spectra, sometimes spanning hundreds of nanometers with little to no identifying characteristics. This set of excitation and emission spectra, for example, could be anything. It's DAPI, a fluorochrome used for studying the nucleus of a cell, if you are wondering. So why is fluorescence used so much? We're not necessarily identifying anything. First of all, fluorescence is a very sensitive technique. Fluorescent signals are extremely strong in intensity compared to UV vis absorption and also vibrational spectroscopies such as Raman or infrared. Because there is a lot of signal to work with, you one, don't need a lot of sample, and two, can get more information from the higher dynamic range of the measurement. Secondly, fluorescence is selective. Probes report fluorescence on a molecular level. 
If you tag a protein that is only located in the nucleus or the cell membrane, you can measure specifically what is going on in those areas, as opposed to other organelles or the cytoplasm, for example. Fluorescence makes it easy to see what you want to see without the guesswork. Also, many molecules are fluorescent naturally, so you don't have to change these samples in any way. For samples that are not naturally fluorescent, there is a whole range of tags or dyes that can be added for a specific application without significant sample prep. For the most part, samples can be measured as is, without having to prepare them in special pellets or media. But of course, we are not using fluorescence to identify mo molecules necessarily, as in the other techniques. Fluorescent spectra are broad, so in general, changes in a fluorescent spectrum are used to track changes in the sample of interest on a molecular level. Fluorescence peak intensity and wavelength are sensitive to a whole host of physical properties, including temperature, concentration, aggregation, solvent polarity, pH, and many more. Let's talk about what we will discuss in this webinar a little bit. First, we will begin with a bit of history about fluorescence. We will talk about some theory and the basic definition of fluorescence and photoluminescence. We will also talk about what types of molecules and materials are used in fluorescence spectroscopy. I will go through the basic components of a spectrofluorometer. Then we will have an overview of different applications and techniques used in fluorescence spectroscopy, along with the types of instruments that is used for such measurements. And we'll talk about what's new. The history is long, and we'll hit only a few of the early high points today. The first recorded observations of fluorescence were in 1565 when a Spanish physician and botanist named Nicolas Menardes published his observations in which he describes the bluish opalescence of a water infusion from the wood of a small Mexican tree. According to Menardes, the solution had a peculiar blue tinge. Around the same time, a Franciscan missionary named Bernardino de Sehagún described the same wood called Cotli by the local Aztecs. It was said that the water infused from this wood had medicinal properties for urine and kidney ailments. Many scientists and physicians, mostly in Europe, used the wood and its medicinal infusions for treating kidney ailments. Other continue, others continued to study the strange blue tinge. This included Robert Boyle in 1664 and John Herschel in 1845. Then, in 1852, George Stokes published On the Change of Refrangibility of Light, where he describes his experiment using sunlight through a prism. He illuminated quinine with different colors and notes that the solution only glows blue when he used ultraviolet wavelengths. It is dark for all other wavelengths used. He sees that, under certain incidences of the light, a beautiful celestial blue color. He uses the term dispersion reflection but then notes, I confess I do not like this term. <laughs> I am almost inclined to coin a word and call the appearance fluorescence from fluorospar, as the analogous term opalescence is derived from the name of a mineral. And so fluorescence was named. So let's talk about what fluorescence actually means. The term fluorescence is actually one type of luminescence. Luminescence, broadly defined, is light emission from a molecule. There are several types of luminescence. Photoluminescence is when light energy, or photons, stimulate the emission of a photon. Chemiluminescence is defined as when chemical energy stimulates the emission of a photon, and this includes bioluminescence, as seen in fireflies and many forms of sea life. Electroluminescence is when electrical energy, or a strong electric field, stimulates the emission of a photon, such as in some lighting applications. Fluorescence specifically is a type of photoluminescence where light raises an electron to an excited state. The excited state undergoes rapid thermal energy loss to the environment through vibrations, and then a photon is emitted from the lowest lying singlet excited state. This process of photon emission competes for other non-radiative processes, including energy transfer and heat loss. When we use the term fluorescence in this webinar, the same methods of measurement can typically be applied to any of the above categories of luminescence. This is the Oblonsky diagram. The left axis shows increasing energy where a typical fluorescent molecule, chlorophyll, for example, has an absorbance spectrum. 
This spectrum shows the energy or wavelengths where the molecule will absorb light. If we use an incident wavelength where the molecule will absorb the photon, the molecule is then excited from the electronic ground state to a higher excited state, denoted S2 in this case. The electrons then go through internal conversion, affected by vibrational relaxation and heat loss to the environment. A photon is then emitted from the lowest lying singlet excited state in the form of fluorescence. In conventional fluorescence, pho photons are emitted at higher wavelengths or lower energy than the photons which are absorbed. This diagram is extremely important to understand for any fluorescent spectroscopist. When we measure a fluorescent spectrum, we are typically looking at the intensity, the wavelength or energy at which it emits, and also the time at which the molecule spends in the excited state. This is the fluorescence lifetime. Any number of things can affect these observables, including energy transfer to and from other molecules, quenching from other molecules, temperature, pH, local polarity, aggregation of binding. Understanding the mechanisms of these transactions can give you insight into what is being observed with a change in fluorescence spectra or lifetime. Fluorescent molecules and materials come in all shapes and sizes. Some are intrinsically fluorescent, such as chlorophyll, and also the amino acid residue tryptophan. Others are molecules synthesized specifically as stable organic dyes or tags to be added to otherwise non-fluorescent systems. There are entire catalogs of these available. Typically, fluorescent molecules have aromatic rings and pi conjugated electrons in them. Depending on their size and structure, organic dyes can emit from the UV out into the near IR, here, we see a random sampling of a few common fluorochromes and their spectra that span the UV visible range. Others, such as fluorescent proteins, semiconductors, phosphors, and rare earth elements are among the commonly used fluorescent samples. Now let's go through the basic components of a fluorometer. First, we have the excitation source. This is typically a xenon lamp for a steady state fluorometer. The broad output of the xenon lamp in the UV visible range makes it perfect for use in steady state fluorometers. Other systems may use lasers, laser diodes, or LEDs, and this is especially true for fluorescence lifetime measurements. Next, we use monochrometers or filters to select the wavelength and the bandpass of light that gets to the sample. This is the excitation monochrometer. The monochrometer may include a diffraction grating, as you can see in this case, where the angle of the grating determines the wavelength of light that is selectively used. The excitation light then goes into the sample compartment where you can have a variety of sample holders and sample handling options. This includes stirring, temperature control, solid or solution holders, and even remote fiber coupling to other things. The sample compartment contains the first of our detectors, which is the reference photodiode. This photodiode measures the lamp output so that any measurement by the emission detector can be corrected for changes in lamp intensity. After another monochrometer to select the emission wavelength, we have an emission detector that measures the fluorescence intensity emitted. Standard detectors are typically in the UV visible range, but extended and near-IR detectors are also used too. Flimeters typically use photomultiplier tubes, but some use CCDs and array detectors. As you can see, a basic fluorometer can be varied with many different illumination and detection options depending on the application. Fluorometers can range from very simple benchtop fluorometers to large modular systems with extended capabilities. These are just a few that we have here at Hariba. Other forms of fluorescence instrumentation include filter-based detection systems for cell sorting, also called flow cytometry, as well as many kinds of fluorescence microscopes. Fluorescence microscopes range from filter-based imaging systems to those that use super-resolution techniques to resolve regions below 200 nanometers, spatially the classical diffraction limit. Today, we will mostly be talking about benchtop systems, but keep in mind that many of these applications may also apply, be applied to a microscope. So who uses fluorescent spectroscopy? That's an easy answer, pretty much everyone. But just to be specific, here are some common areas of research for which fluorescence spectroscopy is especially helpful. This includes material science, life science, 
earth and environmental sciences, and others such as cosmetics, food, and forensics applications. So now that we've seen some history and definition of fluorescence spectroscopy, let's talk about what types of measurements can be done using fluorescence and the applications where these measurements can be applied. First, we can measure a fluorescence spectrum. A fluorescence emission spectrum is when we fix the excitation wavelength and scan the emission. A fluorescence excitation spectrum is when we fix the emission wavelength and scan the excitation monochromator. In this way, we detect at which wavelengths a sample will absorb so as to emit at the single emission wavelength chosen. It is analogous to an, absorb an absorbance spectrum, but a much more sensitive technique in terms of limits of detection than UVVIS. These two spectral types are used to see how a sample is changing. The spectral intensity and or peak wavelength may change with variance such as temperature, concentration, or interactions with other molecules around it. This includes quencher molecules and molecules or materials that involve energy transfer. Some fluorophores are also sensitive to solvent environment properties such as pH, polarity, and certain ion concentrations. One example of how fluorescent spectrum is used is solvatochromism. Most fluorophores are in fact sensitive to solvent polarity in some way. Some are more sensitive than others. Remember that fluorescence is competing with other environmental factors, one of which is solvent interaction. Solvent molecules with lower dipole moments, nonpolar solvents such as hexane and toluene, tend to shift fluorescence spectrum to lower wavelengths. In the reverse, solvent molecules with larger dipole moments, such as water or DMSO, shift the fluorescence spectrum of the same fluorophore molecule to higher wavelengths. You can also have the reverse effect in reverse sylvatochromism. As you can see in this example, the spectrum also may change in shape as well as peak wavelength. We can also use the fluorescent spectrum to track changes in protein folding or unfolding. This is an example of how the fluorescent spectrum of tryptophan in a solution of one micromolar BSA looks with increasing temperature. These curves represent the spectrum going from 5 degrees to 70 degrees Celsius. You can see the spectral intensity decreasing as well as shifting to lower wavelengths as temperature is increased. Another way to use fluorescent spectrum is Forrester Resonance Energy Transfer, also known as FRET. FRET occurs when the emission of a donor molecule overlaps with the absorbance of an acceptor molecule. When the two are close enough, they undergo a dipole-dipole interaction and energy is transferred. The distance at which there was 50% transfer energy is called the Forrester distance, and this value is typically known for common FRET pairs. When you measure the spectrum of the donor alone, and also the donor in the presence of the acceptor, you can use the intensity ratio in the first equation to get the efficiency of the energy transfer. E can then, then be used along with the Forrester distance to calculate R, the distance between the donor and acceptor molecules being measured. This is an animation of how melatonin, an alpha helix with an intrinsic tryptophan, can be measured using FRET. In this case, tryptophan is going to be the donor molecule. If we excite the tryptophan with 280 nanometers of light, you can see fluorescence emission peak around 340 nanometers. Now we put an acceptor molecule, such as Danzel, at a fixed position in the alpha helix. If we excite Danzel directly, this molecule absorbs light around 340 to 350 nanometers and emits at 520 nanometers. The absorbance directly overlaps with the emission spectrum of tryptophan. With both molecules on the alpha helix, we can excite tryptophan at 280 nanometers. Tryptophan and Danzel undergo a dipole-dipole interaction, and the emission spectrum of tryptophan, the donor, is decreased. Additionally, we see emission from the Danzel as well. To calculate the efficiency and distance between these, 
We can measure the intensity at 340 nanometers with tryptophan by itself, and then measure the intensity at 340 nanometers for an alpha helix with both tryptophan and danzel. FRET is also commonly used on a microscope. This is a microscope image of virus particles labeled with yellow fluorescent protein, also called YFP, shown in green. You can see them move on microtubules to the plasma membrane. There, they induce actin polymerization. The actin is labeled with RFP and is shown in red. Using FRET and tracking the intensity of the YFP, you can then calculate the distance between the virus particle and the actin. The next type of measurement is looking at fluorescence intensity over time, or kinetics. Here, we excite at a single wavelength and detect the emission at a single wavelength over time. Sometimes wavelength pairs are used, as you will see. Reaction rates can be followed using time-based measurements, as you can see here. In this example, the reaction rates of the binding of thiamine and mercury to form thiochrome are found by varying the concentration of thiamine used. Each kinetic scan represents a different reaction rate of the thiochrome formation reaction. Fluorescence kinetics are often measured using a fast mixing accessory called a stop flow. The stop flow mixes two or more solutions together on the order of a few milliseconds so that the binding or reaction can be recorded closer to the mixing time zero without the effects of diffusion. Here we have the binding of a fluorophore called ANS to a protein, BSA. ANS fluorescence increases, increases upon binding, so the rate of binding can be measured using fluorescence kinetics. Here, the binding of ANS to BSA occurs with a rate of approximately 400 milliseconds. We get this from fitting the curve. Another application of kinetics is the use of ratiometric dyes for finding probe-sensitive properties such as ion concentration. In the spectrum of FURA2, you can see the fluorescence excitation has two peaks that directly follow the binding of free calcium in solution. At high calcium concentrations, the excitation peak at 340 nanometers is comparatively high. When calcium concentration is low, the excitation peak at 380 nanometers goes up in relation to the peak at 340. Taking the ratio of the intensities at these two excitation wavelengths correlates with the concentration of intracellular calcium. There are other probes that have fluorescent spectra that vary in the same way with physical properties such as solvent polarity, pH, and the concentrations of other ions like sodium, potassium, and magnesium. Here is a graph of the ratio, including, indicating that the intracellular calcium response of an atrium cell loaded with FURA2. By taking the ratio between the two intensities over time, the concentration of calcium ions can be directly correlated to this kinetic curve. Next, a measurement becoming more widely used in the field of fluorescent spectroscopy is the excitation emission matrix, or EEM. You can also look at this as a 3D scan, resulting in a contour plot of excitation wavelength versus emission wavelength versus fluorescence intensity. The Aqualog fluorimeter, for example, was created to quickly measure EEMs of water specifically for analysis of chromophoric dissolved organic matter, also called CDOM. Dissolved organic matter includes amino acids, humic acids, fulvic acids, and other examples of decayed matter in natural water sources or byproducts of water treatment processes. EEMs are used to identify the presence of each at very low concentrations, typically in the PPB range, or parts per billion. Most components of CDOM have broad overlapping fluorescence excitation and emission spectra in the UV visible range. We use many sample measurements of EEMs to create a model and then use chemometrics to get scores of each component in an individual sample. Besides studies of water quality, EEMs are also used to study petrochemicals, which are typically polyaromatic hydrocarbon mixtures. EEMs are also more recently used in food science, including wine, beer, dairy, and bread.
EEMs can also be used to characterize single wall carbon nanotubes. The carbon nanotube, which is a rolled graphene sheet, emits photons due to its semiconductor properties. A semiconductor absorbs between the C2 and V2 energy levels, where the electron hole is passed down. A photon is emitted at the band gap, or C1V1 energy level. These conduction bands and emission bands depend on the diameter of a carbon nanotube, which can also be described as an exciton bore radius. The smaller the radius, the higher the energy, or lower the wavelength, of light absorbed and emitted. The EEM of a sample of single wall carbon nanotubes, a distribution of them actually, is shown here. Each peak can be fit and the excitation and emission wavelengths of those peaks give, it, give information about the diameter and hel helical folding angle of the carbon nanotube. From the EEM on the left, we can then plot the distribution of carbon nanotubes in solution as a graph of diameter versus helicity as you can see on the right. Next, we will talk about fluorescence anisotropy. Fluorescence anisotropy is a measurement of the changing orientation of a molecule in space with respect to time between the absorption and emission events. Absorbance, absorption and emission indicate the spatial alignment of the molecule's dipoles relative to the electronic vector of the electromagnetic wave of excitation and emitted light, respectively. Basically, what that means is that if we excite our fluorophore with vertically polarized light, the emitted light will retain some of the polarization based on how fast it's rotating in solution. The faster the reorientational motion, the more depolarized the emitted light will be. The slower the motion, the more the emitted light will retain the polarization. To use this information, we put polarizers on the excitation light path and the emission light path of a fluorimeter. The anisotropy is calculated by ratioing the intensities in the equation here, where IVV indicates the intensity with vertically polarized excitation and vertically polarized emission. IVH indicates the intensity when using vertical horizontal excitation, or vertical excitation and horizontal emission. G is a grading factor used as the correction for the instrument. The experiment would look something like this. First, the fluorimeter, uh, fluorescence is measured with the excitation polarizer set at vertical and the emission polarizer also set at vertical orientation. The intensity is plugged into the anisotropy equation here. Then, the measurement is repeated with the emission polarizer set at horizontal orientation and the intensity for VH is plugged in here. Next, the G factor is calculated by measuring the intensity at HH and HV and inserting them into the G factor ratio. Anisotropy denoted by lowercase r is often used as an indicator of molecular size, diffusion, and viscosity. Here we can see some equations that are useful for analyzing anisotropy results. The basic anisotropy equation we have already discussed, but the same can be calculated for entire fluorescence decays, giving us time-resolved anisotropy. From the time-resolved anisotropy decay, we can get a reorientational time constant, and then use that in the Perrin equation and the Stokes equation, oh, sorry, Stokes-Einstein-Debye equation, to estimate properties such as diffusion coefficient, local viscosity, molecular volumes. These correspond to very important information when looking at applications such as protein or molecular binding, polymer aggregation, and other local environment studies in complex solutions and materials. As one example, you can clearly see temperature-dependent uh, protein unfolding behavior of BSA as measured by fluorescence anisotropy. The anisotropy of the intrinsic tryptophan residues are used in this case. Next, we will discuss fluorescence single point measurements. Because fluorescence intensity is linear with the concentration of a fluorescent molecule, standard concentration curves can easily be generated and used to determine concentrations of the same molecule in an unknown 
uh, sample. This is useful in quenching experiments where additives decrease the intensity of the fluorophores in a systematic way. Concentration curves can also be created to study how other molecules interact with things like proteins and can, can be used for tracking protein structural changes systematically. As an example of a single point fluorescence experiment, here is a calibration curve of a known set of fluorescent microspheres or beads. Five known concentrations of solutions were used to create the standard curve, and then this was FIT, and the FIT used to calculate the concentration of beads in an unknown solution. Next, phosphorescence is technically a process where the photon is emitted not from a singlet excited state, but from a forbidden triplet state. The time scale of fluorescence emission is generally in the picosecond to nanosecond range, while phosphorescence typically lasts for microseconds, milliseconds, or even longer, minutes or hours. We use a pulse source, typically a flash lamp, to measure phosphorescence spectra and decays on these longer time scales. In one example, we use a delay after the lamp has flashed to measure the phosphorescence spectrum, spectrum specifically. Without a delay, we see both the short-lived fluorescence from the peptide in this sample, as well as the longer-lived phosphorescence of the terbium, which are the smaller, sharper peaks. By varying the delay, you can selectively detect species with longer-lived phosphorescence separate from the background fluorescence in the same sample. The composition of lanthanides in glass materials can be studied using time-resolved phosphorescence decays. Here is data from a study of erbium content in different glasses using this method. The lifetime of erbium can vary with different types of glass and processes used to make the glass. Which leads us into the broader topic of time-resolved fluorescence. The fluorescence lifetime is the time a molecule spends in the excited state. There are actually two main methods used to measure fluorescence lifetime. TCSPC, or time-correlated single photon counting, is the most common technique today, also called time-resolved fluorescence lifetime, or time-domain fluorescence lifetime. While phase modulation, or frequency domain fluorescence lifetimes, was actually the original method used early on. Today, I will only be talking about TCSPC, where we measure the lifetime as a decay and fit the decay to a rate equation. So how is a lifetime measured? When we measure a fluorescence lifetime, a pulse source is used. A population of molecules is excited with a flash, and the population randomly decays back down to the ground state, emitting one photon from each molecule. We can measure the intensity at each time point over the fluorescence emission of this population and get a decay of intensity versus time. The lifetime tau can be estimated as the 1 over E value for a single exponential decay. Of course, real life is most often more complicated than a single exponential. In terms of the instrumentation we use, think about TCSPC like a stopwatch. We pulse a source, most often a laser diode, very quickly with a repetition rate in the megahertz range. The laser pulses are start for the timing event, and the arrival of a fo single photon on the detector is our stop. You can also do this in the reverse. We do this over and over again many times and create a histogram of intensity over time with each event recorded in bins or channels. Because we can time these events very quickly using a time digitizer, we can re record events on the scale of picoseconds or even shorter. In reality, using this method, we can measure lifetimes from about 5 picoseconds to seconds, depending on the source, the detector, and the timing electronics used. Fluorescence lifetimes can also be indicators of local environment. Here's an application where a molecular rotor is used to monitor the viscosity of a sol gel process by fluorescence lifetime. The more viscous the sol gel, the longer the lifetime of the fluorescence probe. Because instrumental sources and electronics are becoming faster and better, we can also measure the fluorescence lifetime of a molecule in kinetics mode. 
Here, the binding of an antioxidant to human serum albumin, or HSA, is detected using fluorescence decay over several seconds. In this measurement, actually, 10,000 decays were measured over 100 seconds total. The nice thing about fluorescence lifetimes is that they are independent of the fluorophore concentration. Here, the lifetime is not affected by the dilution of the sample, but only by the interaction of the curcumin with the protein. The anisotropy experiment also applies to time-resolved measurements. Time-resolved anisotropy is measured here for BSA, showing the reorientation time constants for tryptophan in this protein. This curve was created from the four different decay measurements, VV, VH, HV, and HH, which were used to then calculate the time-resolved anisotropy decay. Two reorientation times in the fit ind indicate potentially different environments or two types of reorientational motions between BSA's three tryptophan residues. Fluorescence lifetimes can also be measured through a microscope to spatially resolve differences in lifetimes from a sample. This method is called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, or FLIM. FLIM fret is a common combination for using FLIM to measure changes in donor lifetimes and ultimately calculate distances within a cell or other sample. FLIM is more recently being used to locate defects in solar cell materials and other photo photovoltaic films. In general, PV materials typically have lifetimes in the hundreds of nanosecond range, but the lifetime of a defect in the material could be measured around 100 picoseconds. This, of course, depends on the material of interest. New applications are pushing technology forward all the time. Less expensive and faster electronics make TCSPC measurements fast and easy. Less expensive, faster, and more powerful light sources such as LEDs, laser diodes, and super continuum lasers with extensive wavelength ranges push detection limits and ease of use and flexibility as well. The latest super resolution techniques use fluorescent spectroscopy through the microscope to break the resolution limit held for many years by classical diffraction limits. And of course, with more and more data coming through, software and analysis methodologies are that much more important. Chemometrics, image analysis, and automation are constantly improving what we can do with the data we collect. In summary, fluorescence is great for tracking changes to a system on the molecular level. It is increasingly used for novel materials characterization and has continued to be widely used in molecular biophysics. New, faster, and lower cost technologies, such as sources and electronics, are pushing new applications forward in the field of fluorescence. So please think about what fluorescence and spectroscopy can do for you. In closing, I also want to mention that at Hariba Scientific, besides providing high quality instrumentation for fluorescence spectroscopy, we have a vast amount of knowledge and experience in our fluorescence applications team. With facilities in Edison, New Jersey, London, Ontario, and Glasgow, Scotland, please utilize our team with your own questions and ideas. We look forward to working with you. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention today, and I will open up the webinar for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Before we get started on the Q&A, just a reminder that you can submit questions by typing them in the QA box at the bottom of your presentation window. <clears throat> All right, the first question that we have is what kind of laser can be used for fluorescent lifetime measurements? Uh, typically, uh, well, always for fluorescent lifetime measurements, uh, you want to use a pulse laser. So things like tie sapphire lasers um, with uh, uh, pulse pickers or so you can select the repetition rate are used, but more recently uh, LEDs and laser diodes are used um, with fast electronics for uh, controlling them as you want. All right, uh, next question here, what are the uses of fluorescent spectroscopy in food science? Ah, okay. Um, so most recently in food science, uh, I mean, there's all different types of food, and there's fluorescence uh, 
there's fluorescent materials in uh, all these different types. Uh, wine and beer, for example, uh, typically the fluorescence analysis of these includes uh, EEMs, as we talked about, the 3D contour uh, fluorescent spectroscopy. Um, doing this, you can actually resolve mixtures um, so that you can uh, track components within different food materials. So this could be, like I said, wine or beer, or uh, it could be dairy, or it could be even bread dough. All right. What are the distances in length scales, for example, that can be determined by FRET measurements? Uh, so for FRET, your donor and your acceptor have to be very close to have a dipole-dipole interaction with each other. So uh, FRET measurements uh, have a resolution of 1 to 10 nanometers, typically. Very close. <laughs> All right, just a couple more questions. Next one here is, can fluorescent spectroscopy be used to measure single molecules? Uh, so yes, there are techniques specifically for measuring single molecules uh, in, in samples. Fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, for example, uh, uses a microscope uh, to look at single molecules going in and out of a very stable light path. Uh, with, with this tracking the fluorescence motion in this light path, you can look at uh, diffusion of single molecules in, in that way. All right. Um, next one. Can EEMs be used to study multi-walled carbon nanotubes? Uh, so the answer to that, as far as I know, is no. Um, single wall carbon nanotubes have semiconductor properties, and that's what gives them the photoluminescence. Uh, Multi-wall carbon nanotubes do not have these same semiconductor properties. So uh, they, they won't photoluminesce, and you won't be able to uh, measure them. That is, unless you add a fluorescent tag, you could do an experiment where you have multi-wall carbon nanotubes and use the fluorescent tag to track them. But it's not in the same way as when we're using single-wall carbon nanotubes. All right, so another question's come in that says, can you please explain further how Hariba can be used for FRET measurements? Uh, sure. Uh, so FRET measurements can be done in two different ways. Uh, I showed the equation for looking at the donor intensity uh, with, of, uh, with the donor by itself and then with the donor in the presence of the acceptor. And that's using a fluorescence spectral intensity. Um, the other way, and actually a better way to do it, is using the lifetime of the donor. So you can measure a sample uh, with the donor and then the donor in the presence of an acceptor and calculate the efficiency that way. Uh, Hariba instruments, specifically, we have uh, steady, many steady state fluorometers, and you can do the spectrum in that way. We also have uh, fluorescence lifetime instrumentation, uh, specifically a FLIM microscope. And so you can do TCSPC techniques and measure lifetimes through the microscope in order to spatially resolve um, what distances your donor and your acceptor are. Okay. All right. All right, thank you, Karen. If anyone submitted questions that were not answered, we will answer them via email. Or you can reply to my thank you email and we will follow up. I wanna thank everyone for their questions and participation in today's event. We hope you found it very informative. Please note this webcast will be available on demand viewing through September of next year you will receive an email from 20 or on 24 alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.